These last couple of weeks, I've uh, been thinking of a trio of miracles, and I want to focus on the one. Uh, it's going to be in Mark chapter 5. It also, these, all three of these also appear in the other synoptic gospels in Matthew and in Luke. But Mark, Mark is usually the most concise, but Mark actually gives us a little bit more information about the miracle that I want to focus on this morning. There's three miracles in Mark 5. The first one is one of deliverance. The second is one of healing in response to faith. And the third is one of the dead being raised to life. And in each of these cases, the people that were involved in all of these, they had their solution, and God had his. And I think we could take some examples from this today in our lives. We see a problem, and what do we do? We seek to find creative ways to solve the problem because we're created in the image of God, and we should be creative and solving problems. And hopefully we're leaning upon Jesus as we do so. But sometimes... God answers in such a, a godly way, a unique way, that we can just sit back and say, well, isn't that just like God to do what I never even thought of? Amen. At the beginning of Mark 5, we read the story about uh, Jesus and his disciples were going over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and they landed in a town known by several different names in your Bible, depending on translations. Uh, Gennesaret, the Gadarenes, and they met a man as soon as they got off the boat, or rather a man met them. Matthew's gospel says there was two men, but uh, Mark and Luke say a man who was possessed by a demon. And it told a little bit of the story of this man in this region in which he lived. He lived in the, in the tombs. They used caves to bury people in, and he lived... Um, in the caves, and he was not in his right mind. Uh, he ran around naked. They tried to chain him. That was man's solution, right? This guy is, is stronger than any man should be. He is a, a menace to society, so we're going to chain him and shackle him. But they found out very quickly that the chains and shackles didn't hold him. He broke them all. So uh, uh, as far as the townspeople were concerned, and probably the man himself, this was going to be the way he was just going to live out his days. So we're told in Mark, when they come to the edge of the water, that the man meets them in the boat and says to Jesus, what, what are you going to do to me? He reckoned that the demons in this man recognized Jesus, and they call him the Most High Son of God. Jesus asked their name. Remember the story? And, and the demons replied, Legion, for we are many. And the story continues that Jesus cast this evil spirit out of this man. And uh, he was now sitting clothed calmly and in his right mind. And the townspeople saw this. Uh, the demons left him, went into the pigs. The pigs went into the, to the water, and the townspeople were upset. And they were frightened, not of the man who had all the strength that they couldn't control. They were frightened that he was normal. And they didn't know what to do with that. You know that there are people today who are scared to death of a genuine move of God. And a lot of them go to church. It's one thing to read stories in the Bible. It's another thing to think that God is still the same today. So they come back to shore. And there's a crowd of people waiting to meet him, <clears throat> keeping in mind that Jesus was getting quite a name for himself in Galilee, and he was healing many. And so when the people knew he went across the lake, they figured he had to come back, right? So if you let your, let your mind's eye go to work, Imagine looking toward the east and you see the boat coming and you just can't wait because you've got all kinds of problems that you want Jesus to solve. So you're waiting for Jesus to come and he comes back and gets out of the boat and the people started to press around him 
And, and right away, this man, Jairus, comes to him and falls at his feet. Jairus was a synagogue leader. He wouldn't have been a rabbi. He was the one in charge of the local synagogue. But his daughter was deathly ill. Mark's gospel tells us at the end of the chapter that she was 12. Uh, Luke's, one of them, says right away that she is 12, and one of them doesn't mention her age. But So Jesus is on his way to go see this girl who is sick and is dying. And can just imagine these people pushing around him, shoving, pushing, all kinds of stuff going on. And you see him like trying to make his way, right? And before he has a chance to get to this daughter, the third miracle happens, which is kind of sandwiched in between the first and the third. And I want to draw your attention to verse 24 of Mark 5. Jesus went with him, that's Jairus, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? The disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. There's been many messages about this, this woman with the issue of blood. And it's supposed that it would be her menstrual cycle, which never ended. Twelve years she suffered with this. Said that she had been under the care of doctors and spent everything she had. It's funny, the manuscripts in Luke, there's different manuscripts. How many of you know that? There's no original manuscripts. And, you know, the original autographs don't exist, but they were hand-copied through the years. And sometimes as they were copied, there were slight variants. And it's interesting that a lot of the manuscripts from Luke don't mention the doctor. And I think that's funny since Luke was a doctor. <laughs> but some of them do. Mark is believed to be the first uh, version to be written down, probably from the 50s, so 20 years after Jesus. <clears throat> but she had spent all her money. And this brings us to the second human response to a problem that we see, and that's throw money at it and try to fix the symptoms of the problem. I don't know when it was that it became legal to advertise medications on TV, but I wish they changed the law back because so much of it, I'm not knocking science or don't get me wrong, but so much of it is treating symptoms. And we don't get the root of it. I mean, man, there's spiritual parallels all through there. If I can just be a better person, I'm going to do better tomorrow. If I can just stop smoking, if I can just start praying, and we try to treat the symptoms of our pathetic life, but we don't give everything to Jesus. You know, somebody here can identify with that. I know I can. So, the human response would be just do anything so that the bleeding stops or at least that she feels better about her condition. And here's this woman that we don't know a lot of. Uh, uh, some extra biblical writing gives her a name, Veronica. The Catholic Church kind of, uh, I think, has venerated her. Um, it doesn't come from the Bible, but there's a, there's a, a book called the... I'm going to mess it up. The Acts of, did I write it down? 
I did, the Acts of Pilate. And it, it speaks of a veil that Veronica wore, and supposedly, by tradition, she was one of the ones that was standing along the Via Dolorosa when Jesus was on his way to Calvary. And the tradition goes that she gave her veil to Jesus to wipe his face and that the imprint remained. Um, that's not biblical. It's not, but I mean, it could have happened, right? But anyway, the Bible doesn't give her a name and doesn't tell a lot about her, except the fact that she had exhausted everything that she knew to do to get relief from this situation. Keeping in mind, too, in a Jewish culture, that she would be unclean. So when you consider the crowds that are pressing around her, it took a lot of gumption for her to even be in public. And I'm sure if she had struggled with this for 12 years in the region of Galilee, sparsely populated, that people knew her. And she's pushing her way through the crowds. There's a great picture, and asked Clay to put up, that I think this drawing is a, a really neat example of maybe what it looked like. Right? In a sea of feet, here comes this hand. And she had told herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Yeah, and he said, your faith has healed you, which is not entirely true. It was his power, but her faith accessed his power. And the fact that he sensed his power going out from him. <clears throat> A little bit later, as you read through the Gospels, and you read through all of the accounts of how Jesus healed people. Sometimes he would just speak to the disease and it would be gone. Sometimes he would lay hands upon them. Uh, the man that he, he spit in the mud and made up some mud and put it on his eyes and told him to go wash. There's all different methods or points of contact that he had people use. And this woman either, either saw somebody else or heard a testimony of somebody else reaching out and touching the hem of his garment or touching him. Or the, the Lord spoke to her personally. But what we can know is that she wasn't the only one that ever reached out thinking that if I can just touch him, I'll be made well. So she's healed and, and she's nervous, you know. Who touched me? Can you imagine that? And a crowd of people and disciples, like, how can you say who touched me? Don't you see all these people around? But there's a difference. It wasn't just bumping up against them. There were people. He knew that somebody had it set it in their mind that one thing they were going to accomplish that day was to touch him. And he saw that faith. He felt that faith. And he felt the power go out from him. And I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, was she, was she afraid that he was going to call her out? After all, he was a respected rabbi. And she was an unclean woman. Or some, some scholars even think maybe she wasn't even Jewish. And, and maybe that's why she had the boldness to come into public in her present situation. Either way, does it matter if someone grew up in that uh, understanding that Jesus was fulfillment of Messiah or as someone who just recognized that there was something in Jesus and had that faith? You know, he came for the Jew first and then the Gentile. But aren't you glad he came for the Gentiles too? Amen. So whatever this woman's uh, station or place in life or whatever her uh, lineage or whatever it is, she determined that she was going to be healed and that she was going to reach out to Jesus. So sandwiched on the other side of the story is the conclusion of what started before is that Jesus was on his way to, to heal Jairus' daughter. Well, the word came, don't, don't bother, she's already dead. Matter of fact, in Matthew's gospel, at the very beginning, he says, my daughter has just died, but if you come, I know that she'll be raised to life. The other ones say that she is dying. So Jesus said, don't worry about it. She's only sleeping. He goes into the house, and, and I want you to notice something that happened when he went into the house. When he said, she's not dead, she's only sleeping, what did the people do? They laughed. They laughed at him. Because after all, death is final, right? Nothing can be done. 
So he went in, and what did he do? He got everybody out of the room, except for Peter, James, John, himself, and the mom and dad. He had to get unbelief out of the room. There were, there were, Jesus was able to do few miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because of his limited power? No, because of their unbelief. But Jesus had to get the unbelief out of the room. Sometimes we stop when God's still going. Sometimes we put a period where God has a comma. Our natural inclination when we think we've come to the end of all hope is to give up. God's solution is often different. So here I am preaching to myself this morning. We could take the woman's healing as a good example, and this has been preached many times about physical healing, and I've, do, I've done that too with this stupid cough. And I can, I can settle, because you've heard, a lot of you heard me say it, this happens to me all the time. I get a cold, I get rid of the cold, I feel fine, the cough lingers. And it comes out of my mouth, and this year especially, I'm going, don't say that. Because you're, you're speaking something. I put a period where God wants to put a comma. So I've been reminding myself what Brother Dan said, that it's all been paid for. That, that the price was paid on Calvary many years ago. And I'm just reaching out. If I can just, if I can just touch him. And I think sometimes in an effort to not focus on the wrong things. Maybe we don't give enough weight to some of the symbolism that we go through when we're trying to reach Jesus. I'll give you an example. There's nothing in the Bible about an altar call. That was something that was popularized two, three hundred years ago in the first great awakening. There's nothing wrong with an altar call. We do altar calls. But I've seen so many of them, and the same people come week after week, that I think their faith is in the altar and not in Jesus. I mentioned earlier about communion. There are some that it's seen as sacramental, that, that if I just come to church whenever they do communion and take the bread and the cup, at least all that other garbage I've done in my life, I don't have to worry about repenting because that will make me clean. There's that mindset. It's an over-sacramental view of things. Um, coming into the sanctuary, right? The church is not the building. We say that all of the time. But as human beings, sometimes we need something that we can touch, that we can put our, our hands on and get a hold of, that can help us to avail ourselves to that which God has already made available. And so if we, if we get too dismissive of some of the religion that goes around what we do, and we just say it's all worthless, sometimes we can really miss what God wants to give to us. Because if I'm standing over here, and I want to touch that table, my perception is that table's too far away. But if I change my perception and move my feet, right, maybe I'm the one that has to move to be able to touch that table. And I think sometimes... We can do that with God. If God wants me to have this, he'll give it to me. And it, we can get really lethargic about it. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, one of my favorite analogies, you've heard me say it. I've only been here four years. You'll hear it some more. But <laughs> if God wants me to fill me with his Holy Spirit, he'll do it. If God wants me to eat lunch today, he'll shove the food down my throat. God wants me to know him better, he'll open my mind. No. It's got to be a hunger. It's got to be a searching. If I can just, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, <clears throat> and we speak of it as far as healing, but it goes further than that. If 
if I can just hear him speak to me. You don't hear him speak if this is closed. But his spirit will confirm what's in here. (laughs) If I can just understand his word, if I can just, if I could just act as spiritual as that person, if I could just have their gifting, uh, if I could just sing like that, if I could just preach like that, if I could just pray like that, and then we just stand back. Like, like all the people in that crowd that weren't nearly as dedicated as this woman was, standing around the edge, you know, afraid to, to just jump in there and go for it. Like, afraid to, how, how, how dare I approach Jesus? He's too holy. Where Jesus rewards those who seek him. Huh? It's the ones who are willing to move their feet and get out of their own man-made ruts. They're the, they're the ones that find him. And this woman, I just see her crawling on the ground. Just crawling, finding her way through. I mean, that, that, that picture we're looking at just is so real to me. And here she is. We don't see her face. We don't see the rest of her. We don't know anything about her. But she's in faith believing. So sometimes what we do in an effort to have that kind of faith is we develop doctrines that say we have to have a garment that we can touch the hem of. We have to have pews and not chairs. We have to be in a building that looks like a church. You see what I'm saying? You have to mix up the spit and the mud and put it on your eyes. We, we can get that carried away too on the other side of this thing. Jesus healed in many different ways, but he's always the one that did the healing. So, what's he speaking to you? Well, why don't we just, why don't we go for it? Okay? Now wait. Now, now listen. <clears throat> We're so cautious, us conservative I said it before, Southern Pennsylvanians, we're so conservative. And we've seen the excesses, haven't we? We've seen the people that are just doing crazy things and claiming it's from God. But I think sometimes we go too far to the other extreme. What's wrong with perhaps God speaking to you that if I can just make it to the front of the church and kneel at this altar, I know he's going to change me. If I can just go over to that person and, and go say, Sarah, would you pray for me? God's leading me for her to pray for me. And, and doing that, can, can that not be touching the hem of a garment? It's not the person, right? Yeah. We're approaching Jesus. Yeah. And I think there is so much more available to us. I know there is. I know there is. And just like other people benefited from this woman's testimony, right? Because she got up in the midst of the crowd, and the Bible says that everybody heard her tell the story. I knew. I just knew. You know that old, I know that I know that I know. I just knew that if I touched the hem of his garment, I would be healed. A lot of people heard that. We already know there was a huge crowd there. Other people told that story. You don't think other people's faith was emboldened? The next time I see Jesus, if I can just touch him, right? And then what happens is our human solution to the problem sometimes takes over. And then we make the solution touching the hem of his garment. And maybe Jesus wants to heal in a different way. We have to be open to what he wants us to do. I I think this morning and tonight, we're meeting tonight, 6 o'clock. And we're just going to come into the room. We don't have any songs picked. uh, No agenda. We're really going to see what God wants to do. But I sense a real season of healing, physical healing. And I believe that can start this morning and can continue tonight. What if, in all your reaching and searching, 
What if it's a matter of you making a decision that I'm going to come out again today at 6 o'clock and I'm going to come into the room expecting? See, that's us moving our feet. For us to say, I want more of God, but He's got to be the one that does the moving. How can we do that? You know, in other areas of the world where there is revival, people have nothing. People have no money. They live in houses with leaky roofs and mud floors. And hundreds of thousands of people will come to the meeting expecting God to heal them. And there will be just multiple miraculous healings. We have gotten so used to things being convenient. We've gotten used to the human answer to the problem. Just like they did in Mark chapter 5. Just like for the guy who was possessed by a demon, well, we'll just chain him up. Or the woman with the issue of blood, well, we'll just take her to the doctor. <coughs> or, or the girl that died, oh, well, it's already done, so we're just going to mourn. You know, they had professional mourners they paid to come in and mourn. For funerals, it was a big deal. What, what if our human response to the problem is not changing anything about the way we act, believe, or dream, and we're just waiting for God to convince us? Oh, man. Oh, man. That's the lukewarm church. That's the lukewarm church. I'm going to do things the way I've always done them. I'm going to do what I think needs to be done. And, okay, God, it's all on you. And he's saying to us today, it's already done. It's already done. Just come. Receive it. It's already done. And you know, I don't understand all I know about that. I'm still learning. I've learned a lot of things in my life that pertain to that. It's already done. Just walk into it. But there are some things in my life that I don't quite get. But I hopefully have a couple of years left on this planet before I see him face to face that I'm, he's going to teach me more and draw me more. Yeah. I'm convinced that if we just simply took what the Bible says to be true, if we actually dared to take him at his word, we, we wouldn't be having all these discussions. We wouldn't need as many of the doctors. We wouldn't need any of the drugs. We wouldn't need as much of all of this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with doctors and medications. And I know people die. God knows that. We've had way too many funerals lately. And I'm not doubting God or doubting anyone's faith. I'm just saying that until God says the story is over, the story is not over. And I think we give up way too quick. So, how would you end that sentence today? If I could just... And then ask yourself, how is God finishing that sentence? What would Jesus say to you if you were able to look him in the face physically on earth today? And you could say, give him all your excuses for not living like the born-again child of God that he made you to be. And you could look him in the eye and say, if I could just, what would that be? And with that, I want to invite you this morning to do something different. Faye, would you come? I want to invite you to do something different. I want to invite you to answer that question for yourself. And that could be physical healing. That could be breaking a chain of bondage. That could be letting go of a habit. That could be changing your thinking. You know, Romans 12, too, one of my favorite verses, that he transforms our minds. That's how he renews us. He changes the way we think. Let God change the way you think.
You're reaching out. You can't figure out why. You can't quite get it. But you're not willing to change anything about what you've got going on. Unwilling to take that step. What if? What if Jesus is in that next step? What if we could take God at his word? What if the Bible said, what the Bible says about faith is true, that it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, that we just simply have to trust him and take him at his word? What if he's answering or filling in that word in that sentence, if I could just, if I could just press into Jesus, I could know that I've been saved, that I've been changed. If I could just press in, he'd fill me with his Holy Spirit, evidenced in gifts of the Holy Spirit. If I could just press into what he's made available to me through Calvary, I could see healing in my body. Huh? If I could just press in, then the Holy Spirit could illuminate his word to me and change my life. If I could just get beyond my my earthly thinking that is keeping me back from what God wants me to be and do. Well, you can. You can. When Jesus was on this earth, it was the physical man, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, and people touched him. When Jesus left, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. So there is no, can I touch Jesus? No, he touched you. It's a matter of coming to him, saying, I, I cannot do anything on my own, but with that indwelling Holy Spirit in me, I can achieve all that you set out for me to achieve. It's not our own strength. It's not our own goodness. It's not our own power. It's his, but it's right there. Yeah, I wonder sometimes, you ever watch... Uh, shows or movies where somebody is invisible and only certain people can see him. That's a bit of a stretch. I'm trying to make a scriptural analogy there, but I mean, think of this. It's more real than what we can see. That answer that's, that's waiting. But you see, it takes some hunger on our part. It takes some want to. You can preach to people all day long. If they have no want to, nothing ever happens. You can talk to people till they're blue in the face, but if there's no want to, they'll never move. But you take a group of people that sold out to Jesus and, and wants to follow him, you take a group of people that says there's more, there's always more. And they're not in it for themselves. They have a heart for other people and a heart to know God better. The, the world has been changed by fewer people than what's sitting in this room right now. And I'm going to ask you to do something different this morning. 